Welcome back. This week we're going to have an emergency stock market update as there is a lot of things going on and we really need to digest this information available as investors and really form a strategy going forward. So I'm going to be talking about a few businesses, the concerns in the current market environment and personally what I'm doing to alleviate that alongside also the comment of the week. So let's jump straight into it and if you like this video, please one of these to help beat that YouTube algorithm. So first things first, Mike Ashley's Fraser's Group has bought Misguided for £20 million. Now you might be asking me, who the hell are misguided? And you know what, that's a fair enough point. But at one point they were speculated to be as good of competition as the likes of ASOS and Boohoo. So this is very much a fashion orientated business. However, they were bought out of administration and particularly here it says beating off competition from Boohoo. Now I haven't followed the situation too closely. But I don't think Boohoo was in any position to really be trying to acquire misguided as furthermore they go straight into the niche that they're already in of 16 to 34 year olds and it's buying a very small amount of market share. So I feel that I don't even think Boohoo were competition in this. They probably expressed some interest. But again, they have a very small net cash position. It's a bit weird. Interestingly, though, they did have a documentary about them. And this is what I found to be quite cool. Because in this documentary, there was a lot of uh, inside information here to do with the industry. And if you're interested in that, it's called Inside Misguided Made in Manchester. It was on Channel 4. There's like five episodes, I think, four episodes. And I think there's a lot that can really be dived upon in the industry. And it's worth watching just to get a better understanding if you hold a stock or share like Boohoo. But furthermore, they were valued at, let's just refresh this because I'm not going to join their email list. You can see here that Misguided's revenue as of the full year of 2019 was £187 million, but they were sold for only £20 million out of administration, suggesting that they were probably struggling a lot. And when you really think about how strong the likes of Boohoo and ASOS are, you don't really give them credit until you realise that these smaller companies are struggling to really etch out any space in this industry. And there is some dominance here by ASOS and Boohoo. Furthermore, BNM, if you've ever been to BNM bargains, you should have in the UK and Europe, they're saying they've got warnings on profit as the cost of living hits their margins. Now, this is a discount retailer. This is not the type of company I would expect to be struggling during a cost of living crisis. Furthermore, I feel that if there is a cost of living crisis, I'm going to be looking for more deals. I'm going to be going to BNM. I'm going to be going to Audi. I'm going to be going to the likes of Lidl. Those discount retailers where I'm able to get a better purchase for the amount of money I have, especially if I'm penny pinching. But they've mentioned here in the last eight weeks that they were very much struggling and that their like for like sales were down about 13.2% against 2022 and 11.5% against 2021. Well, when you compare to 2021, it was likely the case of the uh, coming out of the lockdown. So that makes sense. But 2022, that is quite a significant demand drop. And don't forget, these this company was open during the lockdown. And I find that particularly interesting. Now, obviously, they've given a profit warning where they say that it's going to remain flat. They're not obviously unprofitable and they're also making a lot of money here. But at the same time, if a company like this is saying, you know what? Profits are going to be a little bit hit here. We're going to struggle. That's a concern. And that's really what's brought me into this emergency stock market update. Furthermore, we've got the brand of Fuller's, one of the pub companies, obviously, in the UK, one of the more dominant ones. Now, they've mentioned that they've successfully completed a refinancing of its debt facilities of £192 million, which were due to mature in February next year. Now, they've said that the new debt facilities consist of a £90 million term loan and a £110 million revolving credit facility facility provided by a syndicate of seven banks. It seems like a lot of companies right now are taking up debt whilst it's cheap. I don't know if they've got a fix on the interest rates. They may do, they may not. It depends on the terms of their loans, obviously. But it definitely seems like a lot of businesses are preparing for a cost of living crisis and potentially a recession. And we've seen that priced into the markets here. We've got the likes of Boohoo that was down about 70% in the last year and many, many growth stocks that are similar to Boohoo in some ways or even AIM stocks down significantly. We're seeing people go down the risk ladder. Previously, everyone was hyped about crypto NFTs. Money's kind of going out of it at NFTs, cryptos into growth stocks and those growth stocks are therefore going more into the value stocks which are now starting to go into bank accounts and bonds because interest rates are starting to raise. You can see how people are very fickle in this regard and they're going to follow the trend like a herd. They're going to leave these high risk assets during a cost of living crisis, especially if they haven't got the provisions available to survive during these more difficult times, highlighting the importance of an emergency fund, but also demonstrating enough value to others so that you're able to have a secure income stream during the tougher times. Demonstrating value to other individuals suggests that you're able to continue making money over these times and continue investing, especially when the share prices of these kind of businesses have certainly depreciated in 
at the poorer outlook for the future. So it's interesting here, they've got more facilities and they've extended it to an initial maturity date of about May 2026, with an option to extend by a further year. This is a good thing and the borrowing cost is determined by the level of company leverage. And I think that's good for them. They've done, certainly put off this money and it's something they can worry about in a few years time, hopefully when the cost of living crisis has alleviated as there is some concerns, whilst pubs and uh, grub food really, pub and grub, I don't know why I said grub, but pubs and restaurants are a little bit more Whilst they do lean to discretionary, they're a bit more staple than the just the absolute discretionary items, and they'll likely do okay. And there is a big name brand in the UK that's obviously in the pub chains so that will do very well during a recession, in my opinion, but I'm obviously not going to name it due to a conflict of interest. So the Federal Reserve is in America. If you don't know what the Federal Reserve are, they are basically the central bank of America. They control all of the printing and all of the monetary policy. Right, so QT is quantitative tapering or uh, quantitative... Uh, tightening. This is something that has just started from the 1st of June and they're going to be draining their balance sheet where they have got a significant amount of nine trillion dollars on their balance sheet. So previously during the pandemic we had a point where the lockdowns were ongoing they were chucking out money and they're giving similar checks to everyone but now obviously they're also doing a case of where they were buying up bonds and they were buying up like 45 billion i don't know how much the exact number was but they were buying it consistently during the pandemic to prop up the markets and add liquidity this allowed debt to be readily available and cheap this means that businesses that were hard hit by the pandemic had to close their operations were able to get low interest rate debt at a cheap price obviously because it's low interest and they were able to therefore mitigate the effects of the black swan pandemic and therefore continue surviving however two years later they're now taking this back and they're going to be doing it at quite a fast pace where they're really going to be draining down that balance sheet which is going to lead to the removal of liquidity in the markets now we've already seen growth stocks move in this direction in anticipation of this because it's not like it's a sudden change we'd known that this was going to happen for a while and that's why we've obviously seen that very much discounted it's a question of are the growth stocks going to drop further or are they going to continue holding their value and staying stagnant for the next year or two whilst the indexes or the indices fall in line with it. I'm not saying the indices are going to drop as hard as the growth stocks because the growth styles, uh, stocks have higher beta, they're more volatile, they're going to go up and down by a lot more because they're not a conglomeration of 500 companies for instance, but it could be worth noting here. And quantitative tightening means that it's certainly going to be a lot more uh, well, there's going to be less liquidity in the markets. Less liquidity can equal more volatility and usually a lot of downwards pressure. They're therefore selling this and forcing the banks to purchase these bonds, uh, not obviously the central bank, the central bank's forcing them to purchase it. This could mean, obviously, in this situation, that times are going to get tough. And there's no doubt about it. With raising interest rates alongside this, where I think the Bank of England is on 0.75 or 1%, I keep forgetting, once we see this stuff, this is just going to make the cost of living even tighter. They're trying to catch inflation that's running at like 8 or 9%. They're going to raise interest rates so that they can really catch up to it, which they're not going to, in my opinion. It's going to keep running for a while, and they're going to blame it on Eastern Europe conflicts, which in my mind is a load of rubbish because this was already going up high due to the pandemic and the amount of free money they gave out to individuals. But I'm not going to get political because, quite frankly, I think it's quite pointless. But... I mean, coming from that, and whilst I was someone that was receiving furlough money, for instance, I do think it was an appropriate strategy, but certainly giving out a lot of money, they should have at least taken the liability and said, look, you know what, we gave out a lot of money, it's our bad, we caused this, but they're not going to say that because it's not in their political agenda. Anyway, this means times are going to become tough, people are going to penny pinch. Now, you might be thinking, okay, if we're in the stock market, we know this is going to happen, what do we buy? Do we certainly start changing our strategy, okay? Do we start buying staple stocks? Okay, should I be looking to buy Costco? Should I be looking to buy cigarette companies? Well, in my opinion, no, because I think the movements have already happened. These stock movements have already happened in anticipation of this cost of living crisis. You might think, yes, right now I'm very attracted to tobacco companies. I'm going to be buying them now. Well, that is exactly what the mentality of the herd has done. And that's why they've been buying it and pushing it up. I'm not saying that trend won't continue over time, but I think it is not worth it for the longer term. And I think at the moment, we've got these growth stocks that are heavily beaten up. People are like, oh, I don't want to go near them. They're never going to grow again. I want to stick with these value stocks, the ones that are going to be staple and defensive, even though they've got higher premiums on their valuation. And realistically, I don't think it's going to go well. And if the average investor underperforms, the majority of investors obviously underperform the stock market, I therefore believe that in order to outperform the market, you have got to go the opposite direction to the herd. And that means if the herd is going that way, and they're following into all of these value stocks and tobacco stocks, I'm personally going to differ and go the other way where I'm continuing to buy these beaten up growth stocks at very low valuations where they could drive serious compounding multiples over the future from their current price. Therefore, myself in this emergency stock market update, 
I'm going to be continue buying the growth stocks. I'm also going to have a lot of cash on the sidelines so that if, if there is some volatility, I've got some room to spare and I can buy the dip here and there. And I'm also going to make sure that I'm increasing my income as much as possible because right now in a cost of living crisis, the best thing you can do is push that wheelbarrow forward and make sure that you are earning even more money than before. It's all well and good researching what investments you can get. But at my stage in life where I'm in my young 20s, I'm 22, for instance, the best thing I can do right now is work on increasing my active income, the income I get from working in a job, because that will give me a greater return on investment over time than finding the best place to put my money. I have plenty of time to be invested because I have a longer term outlook and I don't need this money anytime soon. So therefore, I can invest for many, many years and not see a profit, but continue to churn money into that as I raise my income. So that is exactly my goal. The comment of the week here was saying, can you please hold back a bit on UK companies? We investors need to spread our net further, both geographically and from a currency perspective. Now, I understand this. I understand you've come to the channel and you want a more broader stock market outlook. And I'm starting to certainly taper to that. And I'm starting to tackle that issue. I'm now looking to be more globally diverse in my content. And I am talking about a few American companies here and there. But it's difficult for me because these are markets that I've not natively explored, or at least in the UK, I've got now a good two and a half, three years of experience of reading up in it and the general business knowledge that I've got from growing up in the UK. It means that I have a little bit more of an advantage here. And I'm able to therefore give better, more coherent examples and really understand the markets better. That being said, I am looking to push outwards, as I've mentioned, and I will start focusing elsewhere. But I also believe that you guys are watching the channel mainly for my UK content, as obviously specified from the comment beneath where they have said, I love country specific channels because one gets to know the lesser known shares. I find the British stock market very interesting and no dividend tax for me. And of course, everyone has a niche, hence why I'm continuing to produce this UK content. If I start going to chase US stocks and cryptocurrencies and that, I lose the core value of the channel and I alienate my subscriber base. And that's not what we want here. And I want to keep pushing because quite frankly, I like the UK markets anyway, and my investments are here for now. I'm going to keep pushing and learning as much as I can from these markets and then use that skill set over time to push in overseas markets. This is my emergency stock market update. Have a fantastic week.